I use pledge and donation synonymous with one another. They but do I the don't. Miss Heard, I don't use it synonymously. What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts and this is the video we've all been waiting for. Amber Heard's cross-examination and there is a lot of stuff going on. I'm gonna break down some body language. I'm gonna break down some statements that she's making. I'm gonna break down Camille Vasquez and some of what we're seeing with her. That's the lawyer who was actually questioning her. A lot of exciting stuff. Here we go. Yes, I get up and wash my face like most of us um, and I put on right away uh, a moisturizer that has um, tinted foundation in it. And then I put another foundation on because it has sunblock in it. I have a skin condition that my skin reacts to the sun in, in a bad way. So I have, to, I have to wear sunscreen or sunblock and no, one, no woman wants to walk around with a bruise on her face. Uh, and then if you wanna cover up a bruise, um, you obviously put foundation first, concealer, and then on top of that, um, I used a, like a, a bruise kit, not a bruise kit, it's a theater makeup kit, a color correction kit, but I, use, I called it my bruise kit. Uh, yeah, this is what I was talking about as a color correction kit. This is not obviously the exact one I used to carry, but I used to carry it with me all the time. Sometimes this pink is sometimes a little bit more purple of a hue, and sometimes the kits are three colors. You can get them in three or four colors. Sometimes they have even more. Okay, I feel like we're starting with a clip that's just a gift from the gods of behavior analysis. There is so much to talk about here. Uh, first of all, this is not cross-examination yet. It's just on day 16, they were still doing direct and there's a couple of clips that are just gold. This is one of them. We are seeing a significant cluster of deception right there in the beginning. Now I explain what this means in every video because I feel it's very important. A cluster of deception is multiple indications of deception that happen at the same time and are different from the person's baseline. So if I say something now and you think to yourself, oh, I do that all the time when I'm being honest, if you do it all the time, it doesn't matter. And if it happens alone without any other indications, it doesn't matter. There isn't a single gesture that we all do when we're lying, so we have to see multiple at the same time to raise the probability that there's some deception happening. Now this particular cluster happens when she's talking about a skin condition where her skin reacts to the sun in a bad way. First and foremost, it's very rare for someone who has any condition to tell you that they have a condition without naming that condition. So it's much more likely that you would hear someone say, I have eczema or I have whatever the condition is, especially because she's on the stand and she's shown us that she could be very specific about things. We see in just a few seconds how she's gonna be super specific with the color wheel of the, the makeup palette. We see how specific she has been with carpets and drinks and all kinds of events. This is a strange place to not be specific and say, here's the condition that I have. She then mutters the next sentence out of her mouth. She says, reacts to the sun in a bad way. She drops her tone and she kind of says it really fast. And this is something when we do when we're not very confident what we're saying and we just kind of want to get it out of the way. At the same time, we see a lot of eye flutters. This is where the eyes open and close like this very rapidly. Now, she's weird with eye flutters. She'll often go a very long time without doing any and then in a small patch, she'll do a whole ton and this is a great example. When we flutter our eyes, it's typically because we're trying to process information and the brain is slowing down, which happens in deception. We also see a slow blink as she closes her eyes as she's saying that, and her eyebrows kind of go down a little like this, consistent with anger. Now, slow blinks also happen in deception for two reasons. One, we don't want to face the reaction of the people that we're lying to. And second, we just don't want to face this thing that we're saying because we know it's not true. Now again, keep in mind, some people slow blink when they're focusing on something, trying to remember something. So if it's alone, it's meaningless. But here, it's not alone at all. Immediately after the statement, we see her biting her lips really hard and we see that upper lip going inwards with tightness there. Both of these things are consistent with trying to limit what we're saying and it's often seen in deception. Remember, any tightness in the lips, whether it's uh, contracted, retracted, or biting, is like, I don't wanna be saying this. And finally, as she's saying it, she's doing a very classic Amber Heard thing, as her head is going back and forth like this, and it's almost really consistent with what she's saying. It's like, yeah, no, I, I don't have a skin condition. So I'm having a hard time with that statement. Uh, I'm wondering why she didn't tell us what the skin condition is, why she's being vague about something in a sea of being very specific about other things. The reason I believe she's saying this is consistent with something I said in my last analysis of her, 
which is that as part of her baseline, she likes to gain sympathy and pity from people. So I feel like this is something she's saying, like, I have a skin condition, I'm sensitive to the sun, feel sorry for me, as she's going towards a story where she's going to be needing sympathy. We see something really interesting when she says, no woman wants to walk out with a bruise on their face. First of all, interesting choice of words. I don't think any man wants to walk out with a bruise on their face either, but she does this a lot where she reminds the jury that she's a woman, maybe to gain more sympathy, but the body language here is spectacular. We see her two shoulders slowly go up. This isn't a fast thing as she tilts her head and looks at them. This is a classic display of innocence. We're exposing our neck like we're vulnerable. We're bringing the shoulders up. In fact, we see this a lot in cartoons when a character is trying to show innocence or like they didn't do something or they're trying to gain sympathy. Then as she introduces the makeup palette, she says, bruise kit, not a bruise kit. So her tone goes up as she perks up. Notice that I flutter again and she's really trying to correct herself on that and not call it a bruise kit. And there's a very good reason for that and it's due to what she does for a living. As a lot of my subscribers know, I've spent a lot of time on television and stages all over the world and Amber is a professional actress and on stage, on television, a bruise kit is not a kit that hides a bruise. A bruise kit is a makeup kit that allows you to fake a bruise. So the moment she called it that, she instantly corrected herself and said, I call it a bruise kit. It's different than what a bruise kit actually is. That's just what I call this one, which I use to cover bruises and instantly her eyes shoot to Elaine. There isn't a pause, nothing, she just goes right to her own attorney, Elaine, and it's almost like, please help, we gotta, we gotta move, we gotta keep moving away from this. The next thing I found fascinating is her use of the word obviously, which she says twice in that clip. The first one is, obviously you put foundation first, and the second is, obviously not this exact one. Now obviously is a literary term that we use to preface a statement that we think everybody would instantly know. So like, Obviously, I'm sitting down now. Yeah, I obviously am. Everybody would agree to that. In both of these cases, I'm not so sure that this is something that's that obvious. You know, obviously you put foundation first. Does everyone know that? Is that like a known fact that nobody would contest? And second, um, obviously not this exact one. Well, how do we know it's not that exact one or the exact same version as that one? We don't have any way to know that. I believe she's using obviously here as a way to express how knowledgeable she is about makeup. And we see that in the way that she shifts to a tone of lecturing here. She's giving all these details and obviously this and obviously that and some palettes come with three but some come with four or even more and it's almost like an infomercial at some point for makeup. And I believe the reason she's doing this is to make herself seem like the makeup expert of that room. Like nothing she says about makeup and covering up bruises can be contested because she knows more about this than anyone. These things are obvious to her. And I think this is all part of her plan so that later when the other attorneys question her about covering things up with makeup, well, they're not the experts, she's the expert. I was begging Johnny to not make me prove what I've had to sit on the stand in front of all of you and prove and talk about. I was begging not to do this and have to sit where I'm sitting today I didn't want this. I don't want to be here. I didn't want to be there then. And I was trying to point out something to somebody who I thought did not have a firm grasp on reality. Objection calls for speculation. Good Overruled. Good. Thank you. I was trying to point out how absurd, how absurd it would be for him to keep making me prove this by calling me a liar. I was trying to get him to not call me a liar because everything that I had said to date and everything I've said to date now is the truth. And I was begging him not to make me prove it, that there were photos, that there were witnesses, that there was my testimony. There is something fascinating right there when the objection kicks in. We see a very quick fade of her emotions. She's in this emotional space and she's you know, getting all worked up, and the moment that objection comes in, it all fades really quickly. That's not really the way emotion works, especially when we're that worked up. Typically, it takes a moment, we stay emotional, you know, especially because we still intend on telling the story, but on her face, it just goes away completely. Then when it's time to resume, first we see a lip lick, she licks her lips, and this is something that we see 
either when someone's stressed because the mouth dries up or it's a grooming gesture. It's something we do to bring more color to the lips and seem more appealing. And what's really interesting is she picks up with the same exact words as the sentence she was cut from. And I was trying to point out, I was trying to point out. This is to me exactly like she's in a movie scene and the director yelled cut because that's exactly what you would see in an actor. They're getting all worked up. They're doing their scene. Director yells cut. They stop. They internalize. And then here we go. They might clear their throat, lick their lips and jump right into it and pick up where they left off. In a real story, that's not the way it works. You, you don't, first of all, you don't fade away completely. You stay in that emotional place. Then you keep going. The words wouldn't be exactly the same. So to me, that really felt like this was a scene she was acting and the director yelled cut. I have a feeling you're going to love this next thing. I use this a lot in analysis and I really don't talk about it often. So it's kind of like a little analysis secret. People signal to us their priorities in the order in which they list things. In an overwhelming majority of the time, we build up and we end strong. So as an example, let's say I'm telling you about a trip I took to the Bahamas a couple of years ago. I might say something like, the weather was great, the food was amazing, and I went swimming with sharks. So I build up to the most impressive one, which means that regardless of what an outside person might think, to me, to the person telling the story, the food was more important than the weather, and the fact that I went swimming with sharks was the most impressive thing of all. Because if I said that in the wrong order, it would feel anticlimactic. Like, I went swimming with sharks, the food was amazing, and the weather was great. It's like, wait, what? What's going on? Why didn't you end on the big one? So listen to what she said right there at the end. She said, there were photos, there were witnesses, there was my testimony. So she builds up to her testimony. That's the big one. Isn't that really strange? Wouldn't you assume that photos and witnesses are more important than testimony? And in a list like that, that would hold more weight? The way she said this signals me that she puts more importance on her testimony than photos and witnesses. And that is really telling because either that means that she's severely over evaluating her own testimony or she's subconsciously signaling to us that she knows that her witnesses and her photos are not that strong. Okay, now we're gonna jump right into the cross-examination and talk about not only Amber Heard, but also Camille Vasquez, who's doing the questioning and the dynamic between the two. And there's some great stuff here. But before we do, do me a big favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavior analysis. And you told this jury that on this occasion, Mr. Depp was kneeling on your back. That's correct, in the closet. And you also told this jury that you wore a backless dress to the Mordecai premiere that very same night. I did. And you didn't show this jury a picture of you in that backless dress though, did you? Um, I don't know what you mean. I'm sorry. You didn't show this jury a picture of you at the Mordecai premiere wearing a backless dress, did you? I haven't had the opportunity to. Okay. I assume you have it. I do. Um, let's please pull up plaintiff's exhibit 1256. <laughs> this is a picture of you and Mr. Depp, or the back of you. This is you in the backless dress at the Mordecai premiere in Tokyo, right? That is correct. You would agree that there are no bruises or visible marks on your back in this picture? No, not that I could see. Oof. So we start there with her saying, I don't know what you mean to an extremely simple question. And then what's crazy about it is the lawyer just resets the question, changing one word. And now all of a sudden she understands what she means, which leads me to believe that she kind of understood what she meant the first time. So very often when we repeat a question or ask someone to repeat a question, this is a mechanism for buying time for us to think about what to say. So I feel like she knows what's coming and she just needs a little bit of time to think of an answer. This is further corroborated with what happens next. And when the question is asked again, she looks over to the jury and she does this a lot, by the way, and this is called a confirmation glance. She's trying to gauge their reaction. She's trying to see, do they think this is important? Are they excited about this picture? How are they feeling? Then she goes, I'm assuming you have it as she nods like this and her shoulders go up. And this is an attempt to try to get ahead of it. Like, it's, yeah, totally. You should show them. It's not a big deal. I have nothing to hide. There's nothing to see. And you're right. There's nothing to see. There's no bruising on your back. So it makes sense that the prosecutor would want to show this to the jury. But why are you saying, you know, I haven't had the opportunity, but yeah, if you have it, go ahead. 
how does this play into your narrative? Then the picture is shown, we see her look straight down to it and we see a little smirk. That is a misplaced smirk because she, they've been talking about the bruising of her back. She's looking straight down. She realizes there's no bruising there. We see the smirk. I believe that's duping the light. Duping the light is a small smile that we see in people who are being deceptive and it's connected with the excitement of getting away or the thought of getting away with a lie and it can even happen when we're caught in a lie. Notice how sometimes if somebody catches you in a white lie, you might smile like, yeah, okay, yeah, I did it and I believe that that's what we're seeing here. This next part was coincidental but really telling. Somebody in the gallery sneezes and she looks up and takes so much interest in this sneeze like, what's going on out there? because anything that'll distract away from this bold-faced lie that she's being caught in is interesting to her. And we see that a lot in deception. When somebody's being deceptive, and you can even use this in games of deception, like Werewolf or Among Us or Poker, when there's something else that happens or the subject changes, someone who's being deceptive will embrace that change of subject, will embrace that new element, because it gets them to focus away from this deception that's stressing them out. So to her, this sneeze is really, really interesting. Then she's asked the question about the backless dress and she doesn't even look at it again. She can't face it. She knows this is incriminating. So she just kind of goes straight from here to there without even looking at the picture again. So to me, everything that just happened is very consistent with someone who knew that they were gonna get caught up in a lie and then got caught up in a lie. She knows this is bad. She knows she said something and these pictures prove the exact opposite and this is about to happen a lot. In fact, most of this cross-examination is Camille Vasquez saying, here's what you said, and here's direct evidence that that's not true. Now, as you all know, in my analysis, it's very important for me to be unbiased. When I point out behaviors in clusters, I often say, here's what it could be, but it could also be this, and I always encourage you to keep an open mind and say, listen, we don't have all the answers and it's arrogant and silly for us to say, she's lying about everything, he's a saint and he's telling the truth about everything. There's nuances, there's gray areas and almost everything exists in a gray area. So my position throughout this whole thing has not been that she's lying about absolutely everything. It's very rare that anybody lies about absolutely everything. It's really difficult to do. But when things like this happen, where it's not the behavior that's indicating a lie, but direct evidence that's indicating a lie, it's really hard to defend that. So again, am I saying that everything she's ever said is a lie? No, I think that some of what she's saying is based in truth or her perception of the truth. But in this case, you can't deny it. That's a lie. Do you re recall giving that testimony, Ms. Heard? Yes, exactly. So you had a broken nose, right? That's absolutely what I thought had two black eyes after this incident, right? I did have two black eyes after that incident. And you testified that you also had a busted lip. That is uh, correct. From December, yes, that's correct. You testified that the lip wound kept reopening when you moved your mouth. That's correct. You also testified that you had bruising on your temple. That's correct. And bruising on your chin. Correct. You appeared on the James Corden show the day after this alleged incident, right? I did. And that was December 16th, 2015? Your Honor, I'm so sorry, but it's not published to the jury. If we may have it, oh. please, published. Okay, thank you. Apologies. If we can please start that you over. Start it over, I'm sorry. Thank you, Your Honor. That's a photo of you opening your mouth on the right, right? That's correct. And again, an, a larger view of the same photo on the bottom. That's correct. With a split lip. You've seen pictures of it without makeup. Yes. So you had a split lip when you I were sure moving did. your mouth that way. I sure did. In those photographs. Absolutely. Okay. Before we analyze this response, let's talk about how she's doing overall in the cross-examination from a body language perspective. Because strictly from a body language perspective, she's actually doing pretty well. Here we're seeing some stuff we're gonna talk about, but generally speaking, those clusters of deception aren't that high. There's a few, but not an enormous amount. But more importantly, we're not seeing a lot of that over-exaggerated emotion and this sort of drama and this emotional retelling. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is because she is not acting, she is reacting. She's being thrown all these things and she has to act really quick so she doesn't have time 
to go into that role and bring out those emotions. The second reason is quite simply because she's not giving testimony here. She's just confirming testimony. So a lot of these questions is Camille saying, do you remember this? And her going, I do. I did say that. And that's truthful. She said that. What she said may have been a lie, but the fact that she said it is truthful. So we're seeing a lot of reactive stuff here, not so much proactive. But here we start to see some interesting stuff. When she's asked about the broken nose, she said, that's absolutely what I thought, which is really interesting because it's absolutely, like that's a strong word, what I thought. But absolutely what I thought isn't absolutely anything. Might as well just say, I thought I had a broken nose. But during her testimony, she seemed very convinced that she had a broken nose. But here, she's sort of at the same time trying to make it like absolutely, but what I thought contrast there. Then with some of the other answers, we're seeing those flutters and a bit of hesitation that's out of place, but we're not getting an overwhelming amount of deception here because she's just confirming, yeah, that's what I said, that's what I had. It's just sort of, like I said, reactive. Then the question about James Corden comes up and oh boy, is this a beautiful moment. The moment the Corden interview comes up, we see her go down with a deep exhale as she closes her eyes and she goes like this. You appeared on the James Corden show the day after this alleged incident, right? I did. And that was December. I did. And that was December 16th. This is unmistakable. She knows this is not going to be good. She knows something's coming. So she's shown the pictures where, you know, supposedly this is the day after she had two black eyes, a broken nose, a split lip, and we see her on the interview and they play a clip. And then we see the pictures of her with her mouth open and to anyone looking, it's obvious that her lip isn't split, but she alleges that it is. And Camille Vasquez does one of the most beautiful things that she does quite often, and it's psychologically so, so powerful. Notice how she never says, Ms. Heard, your lip is not split in this picture. She never says that. She never fills in that blank. She never provides a conclusion in this case. And she's gonna do this a lot throughout her questioning where with her questioning, she brings us to the conclusion, but she never gives the conclusion. And the reason for that is because psychologically, we accept and stick to conclusions that we came to ourselves a lot more passionately and firmly than conclusions that were given to us. When someone says something to us, we can question it. We go, hmm, do, I, do I agree with that? But if we're brought to that conclusion and we're the ones who decide that, we are a lot firmer in our belief. So for example, if I really wanna make you see that a close friend of yours has an alcohol problem, if I just come up to you and go, your friend has an alcohol problem, you might go on the defense and go, oh, come on, everybody likes to have a drink every now and then and all this stuff. But if I say something like, uh, when's the last time that you had to pick them up and drive them home? And they go, just this Saturday. And I go, okay, and how often does that happen? And you go, well, it actually happens quite often. I think I would say maybe once a week. And I just bring you to that conclusion where you go, yeah, you know what? I, I think there's a problem here. So again, she often brings us to that point, but never actually says the thing that we're all thinking. Speaking of Camille Vasquez, let's talk about right there when the video wasn't going as planned. Notice how courteous and polite she is to the judge. That snappiness that she has, that powerful warrior of a woman that we're seeing who's absolutely grilling Amber, and we're gonna see a lot of that coming up, vanishes, and we see a sweet little version of her who's super courteous. And it's not the only time we see this. Anytime she addresses the judge, there's even a point where she addresses a deputy sheriff, she's super polite, smiley, and kind. This contrasts so much with the side of her who's directly questioning Amber Heard. I firmly believe that this speaks to how much Camille connects with Johnny and really feels for him and she wants to bring this really powerful side of her out to really get this woman. Amber brings out the worst in her and I think this subtly plays to us as the viewer and to the jury to say this is the effect Amber Heard has on people. She brings out the worst in people and again it's also very telling that this woman is getting very emotionally invested in defending her client. It would be very difficult to do that for someone that you don't really connect with. You gave these pictures to People Magazine after you publicly accused Mr. Depp of domestic abuse, didn't you? I didn't personally know. 
This was you protecting Mr. Depp after you got the restraining order against him, isn't it? No, this is him calling me a liar and me forcing to prove it, as I mentioned to you earlier. So you did give these pictures to People Magazine? No, I gave these um, pictures actually to my lawyers and my representatives at the time. Um, so it's your testimony, Ms. Heard, that your lawyers and representatives gave these pictures of their client to People Magazine in the middle of a contentious divorce? I certainly did not personally give it, no. Right there in the beginning, she says she didn't personally give the photo to People Magazine. This is what we call an exclusion or exclusion qualifier. Basically, this is a way that we deny something without really denying it. Because what does that mean you didn't personally give it? Did you impersonally give it? Did you give it to someone who gave it to them? So by saying personally there, she can wash her hands of it because that's technically true, but it's not really a denial. Then she immediately says, no, this is him calling me a liar and me forcing to prove it. She meant being forced to prove it, but doesn't that counter what you just said? Like if this is you proving that you're not a liar, you did give it to People Magazine. I'm so confused as to how she just denied it. Then she said, no, no, this, this is what this statement means. Okay, so you gave it to them. Immediately after that, we see something that she's been doing a lot with Camille Vasquez, but she has not been doing with her own lawyers as often, if at all. And it's before uh, Camille has finished her sentence, we already see Amber turning her head to face the jury. And this is two things. One, it's once again, she's showing her priority that she's really trying to communicate whatever it is to the jury. But second, it's a signal to Camille saying, you can't hold my attention. She does this a lot. Before she's even done her sentence, she just turns around like, it's very dismissive. Like, you, you, can I just speak to them now? I don't care about you. Finally, she just throws her legal team under the bus. And I'm not sure that's such a great idea when you're in court. She literally just says, you know, her lawyers, she gave her pictures to the lawyers, insinuating that they were the ones who gave it to People Magazine. So what does that tell us when here we have someone on the stand that is willing to just throw her lawyers under the bus, being questioned by someone who is adamantly and passionately fighting for her client? That's a question mark. What does that tell you? Okay, I just realized what I did there. I did what I said Camille does earlier where I, I brought us to the conclusion that I didn't quite say what the conclusion was and now I don't want you guys to think back to it and be like, oh my God, he's doing that thing that he said he did. Basically, it tells me that Johnny Depp has a, a better or healthier relationship with his legal team than Amber does with hers. That, that's the conclusion that I was trying to insinuate. You don't have any medical records reflecting that you required any dental work during your relationship with Mr. Depp, do you? Uh, I don't know. I don't, rec I don't recall. You don't recall one way or another seeking dental care for any injuries you allegedly sustained? Uh, you asked me about if I had produced records or if I had records. That's a different question. Did you ever see a dentist or an oral surgeon as yes. a result of any injuries you sustained with Mr. Depp? Not about any injury I had from Johnny, no. That is, I think, my favorite response in the entire cross-examination. And it's such a great example of how when we apply critical thinking, not only to individual answers, but how they work together, we start to uncover some really great stuff. So look at what happened there. If you look at each of those questions separately, there isn't much going on. But if you put them together, something doesn't make sense. She's asked first, do you have any records of anything that may have happened you know, to your teeth. And she thinks about it, she hesitates. And then she goes, I don't know, I don't recall if I have any records. And that might seem like a good answer. Okay, you, you don't know if you have any records. Maybe something happened, you don't have records. Now the question is asked, did you go seek dental care for any injuries you sustained while you were with Johnny? And she now says, no, not while I was with Johnny. So again, that, that's a good answer but it doesn't work with the first answer. Because if you never had injuries to your teeth while you were with Johnny, what do you need to think about? Whether there are records or not. Records of what? You just said you never had any injuries to stay on your teeth. Those two answers separately might make sense, but together they make zero sense. Okay. You spoke about donating your divorce settlement on a Danish TV show, correct? Uh, I believe I said I had um, 
I, I believe I said I donated it to charity, but it was already printed or already commented on and stated in the press. I had already released that information in the press. I think I just confirmed it on that show. What did you do with that money? Seven million dollars in total was donated to, I split it between the ACLU and Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. ACLU is a human rights organization. Sorry, ACLU is a prominent um, uh, organization, nonprofit organization in the United States. Yeah. This interview was in October of 2018, right Ms. Heard? I don't recall when it was. It was in 2018. Right, Ms. Heard? I don't remember when this was done. This was after you had received the full $7 million of your divorce settlement for Mr. Depp, wasn't it? Again, without knowing when it was recorded, I have no idea. And in fact, your exact words were, quote, seven million in total was donated to, I split it between the ACLU and the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, end quote, That's right? That's correct. I made that statement as soon as I got a divorce and we reached the settlement. That's when I pledged it, right then. Sitting here today, Ms. Hurd, you still haven't donated the $7 million divorce settlement to charity. Isn't that right? Incorrect. I pledged the entirety no, of Ms. the Heard, settlement, $7 that, million, to question. charity, and I, I Heard, intend to Ms. fulfill Heard, those obligations. Ms. Heard, that's not my question. Please, what try was your to question? answer my question. Sitting here today, you have not donated the seven million dollars donated not pledged donated the seven million dollars divorce settlement to charity i use pledge and donation synonymous with one another they, but i the don't miss heard i don't use it synonymously that's how donations are paid miss heard respectfully that's not my question you wanted to make those claims seem believable they are believable. They you were You wanted believable. them to be seen. You wanted to be seen, excuse me, as a noble victim of domestic violence. I have you? never, never wanted to be seen as a victim. Nor have you, I ever called myself one. The statement. When you say you buy a house, you don't pay Ms. for the Heard, entire house Ms. Heard, at one time. You pay it I'm over not asking, time. Ms. Heard. All right, next question, please. Thank you. <sighs> okay, first of all, um, Compare this to her direct examination, where in her direct examination, everything was, I remember this, I recall that, I know this, I remember, I remember. She said, I remember hundreds of times when her lawyers were questioning her. She gave details, she knew things, dates, exact things immediately. Now, there's so much I don't remember, I don't recall, I don't know. All of a sudden, her memory is completely failing her when it comes to these inconsistencies, but let's move past that. Notice how when the host on that show asked her about the donation, she gave a quick answer without too much detail, and then the moment he asked about the charity, she immediately jumped on that and talked at great length about the charity itself. This goes back to what I was saying earlier. People who are being deceptive will embrace a subject change because it gets them away from the thing that's making them nervous. So just like that sneeze was really important earlier, right now talking about these charities is so much more important than her donation. Then we get a lot of back and forth and Camille Vasquez is again unleashing that inner warrior that is keeping Amber in the literal. Now I talk on the channel quite a bit about how to handle manipulators or gaslighters. I have a full video on it. I'll leave a link in the description. But what Amber Heard is doing right now is a classic technique of a manipulator where they try to present their opinion as fact. So they'll say what she's saying here, which a pledge and a donation is the same thing to her, but Camille is not having it. She is staying in the literal and she's saying, no, no, that's not what I asked you. I get that's what you think, but that's not what I asked you. I don't consider those the same thing. Please answer my question. So she is really staying in the literal and that's amazing. Then she gives a really, really important response, which I'm gonna give a lot of importance to because she's in this sort of emotional mode. I think this is a slip up because Camille says, you were just trying to make those claims believable. And Amber's response is, they were believable. They are believable. Not they're true, they are believable. So imagine if you come up to me and you tell me something completely false, you say something like, oh, you're, you're trying to make it sound believable that you weren't robbing a bank yesterday. And instead of going, what are you talking about? I wasn't robbing a bank yesterday. That's just not true. I would go, no, I, I, think, I think it's believable. I think my story was believable. That, that's not a logical response. So just the fact that she would say believable as opposed to it's true 
to me is a hint that she knows that there's a difference between a pledge and a donation. Then we get the line, I've never wanted to be seen as a victim. Okay. And finally, we have the worst metaphor that I've ever heard in my life, maybe potentially, where she compares giving a donation to a charity to buying a house. And that when you say you've bought a house, you haven't made all the payments yet, you, you are making payments. Well, there's two problems with that metaphor. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more, but two that stand out to me. First, what are your payments? You're not, you're not giving us the payment plan. But the bigger problem is this. When you buy a house, the person you bought it from gets all the money. Then you're on a payment plan with the bank or whatever it is, but the person gets all the money. So in this metaphor, it doesn't work at all because it's not like the charity got $7 million and you are now you know, paying towards that donation or 3.5 million, 3.5 million, and you're working to pay that off, they didn't get anything. This is the picture, this picture shows an injury to Mr. Depp's face, doesn't it? I disagree. I've seen this, this is, picture. Uh, okay, Ms. Hurd, I've seen I got this picture the answer. Thank before, you. and it, you he's disagree? not injured in it. He's not injured in this picture. Mm -hmm. That's your testimony, fine. This one is uh, Photoshop. Ms. Hurd, I have your answer, thank you yet another colossal contradiction to herself. This isn't like there's one piece of evidence contradicting something else she said. Within that statement, within seconds of each other, a direct contradiction. Because her first response is, the lawyer asks, this is a, we see an injury on Johnny Depp, and she goes, I disagree. We don't see an injury. Okay, well then immediately after she goes, oh, I, I, this picture is photoshopped. So, photoshopped to what? Photoshopped to look like there's an injury but you just said it doesn't look like there's an injury. It's unbelievable how often she's saying things that directly contradict each other within the same statement. It starts with a text message from you to Mr. Depp on September 26, 2015, right? That is correct. And you write, monster is back, this is him. Did I read that right? That is correct. And then in the next message you write, quote, ran away, first sign of trouble. This is not the man you promised you would be. Ms. Hurd, you're talking about Mr. Depp running away from you at the first sign of trouble, aren't you? No, I'm, um, I'm recognizing the clues at this point when he would run away at the first sign of trouble. Often that was a clue for me to know that he was back using again and that we were about to enter the next phase of the cycle. And you describe his running away from you as the monster, right? That wasn't what was a monster. The monster was the man who beat me up. The running away was just a, attached to that. It was a sign, a signal to me as a clue as somebody trying to put together clues. In these messages, Ms. Hurd, the exactly. monster isn't Mr. Depp doing drugs, is it? It was always um, the man who did drugs and beat me up. Yes, that's always been the monster. But that's not what you're saying in these messages. That is exactly what I'm saying in the messages. You don't describe Mr. Depp being violent, do you? I do not describe that in this text message, no. So it's a cowardly monster this time? No. I'm sorry, but again, it just doesn't make sense. And, and I'm tired of this. Like, I'm so sorry because I know it seems that again in this video, I'm really on Amber's case, but you know, I've made videos in the past where there were moments of what Johnny Depp said that I think, you know, he's admitting something. I don't think either of them is a saint. I've said that again and again. And I, and I think this is so hurtful to her cause because when she's telling these things that don't make sense, it just makes us and the jury want to throw everything away and just say she's lying about everything. So if there's a semblance of truth somewhere, we have no clue where it is. Because again here, and we're seeing this so much, in her testimony, she said that she was the one who tried to get away, to put some distance, to calm down, and he was running after her, and she had that weird sort of shift where she kind of slipped up that that wasn't true. We talked about that in my last analysis video. But here, and multiple times in this cross-examination, it's very clear that he's the one who wants to put some distance and she hates that. We see it in a text, we see it in two different recordings where she freaks out when he wants to put some distance between the two just to calm down. So here she's saying, she's referring to him in text as the monster for trying to just take a little bit of space and then she says that the monster is the person who beats her up but he's trying to get away. So how is it possible that he's trying to get away and she's saying, this is the monster who beats me up? He's trying to put distance between the two of you. Like, I'm not an expert on hitting someone, but I kind of feel like you have to be in the same room to do that. 
when I say reach, I'm specifically saying I would like him to know information coming from me or coming from Jerry, from me, so that he finds out about the divorce filing or my intention to do so from some other source other than TMZ, which was alerted. You slipped up there, didn't you, Miss Heard? You let it slip out that TMZ had been alerted to your filing of the domestic violence restraining order, didn't you? I disagree. That's not what I'm talking about. TMZ is the same outlet that you released the video of Mr. Depp attacking the kitchen cabinets the day before this deposition was taken, wasn't it? I didn't do that. I don't TMZ know how owns to do that. The copyright to that video now, doesn't it? I have no idea what TMZ owns. Did they owns. pay you for that? I never got paid for it because I had nothing to do with that. So TMZ was just lucky in getting the inside scoop to your divorce from Mr. Depp, huh? I have no idea. It is not, that's not my area of ex expertise. I wouldn't even know how to do that. Oh my, oh my God, that, I hadn't even seen that bit of the deposition, but oh my God, like if I ever have to teach mouth blocking and grooming, that's the best example I've ever seen probably in my entire career. So I often say in my videos that part of the reason mouth blocking contributes to a cluster of deception is because when we're little, we learn that when we say something we don't want to say, we block our mouth. As teenagers, we become better at it and we do more subtle things like this. And as adults, we go for the nose or we go for this area and we cover the mouth. But here, we saw a full on mouth block. The moment she said TMZ and realized she wasn't supposed to say that because she wasn't supposed to leak that and she's denied having leaked that, her eyes shoot up as her mouth comes up. She stops talking and on her way up goes, oh my God, oh my God, this, this is gonna be too obvious. So goes here and grooms her hair, which is like fixing herself to look good. What a crazy moment. And she just stops talking because she realizes she messed up. That can't be anything else. Then we cut to the courtroom and Camille Vasquez is asking her about that. Like, you slipped up on that, didn't you? And she denies it. Like, like, look, you don't even have to be a behavior analyst to know exactly what that was. And she denies it. I believe that in moments like this, if she said, yeah, listen, I did something I wasn't supposed to do. I sent that video to TMZ. It was a very emotional time for me. You would gain a little bit of credibility. But when you're looking at a room full of adults and you're saying, no, that's not what that was about, and you just keep denying these things, and then she goes twice, I wouldn't even know how to do that. You wouldn't know how to send a video to TMZ? Really? You would not, come on. Like, are we really supposed to believe this? So to me, the credibility is just on a very, very slippery slope. You know what I feel like these last few clips are? In fact, a lot of this cross-examination, I feel like Amber Heard is like Mario in Super Mario Brothers, and Camille Vasquez is the level. Like she's just throwing all these fireballs and all these bad guys and Amber Heard is just trying to survive each one. And she's not thinking about what she said earlier, what she's about to say. She is literally just trying to dodge every question that's coming in. And I don't know how well she thinks she's doing, but it's not looking great. And, but I'm gonna be honest, again, from the body language perspective, She's just blatantly denying these things. We're not seeing a whole ton of clusters. I pointed out a few. There's some isolated behaviors that we talked about, but we're not seeing an overwhelming amount of clusters because I think she's just reactive at this point and just shamelessly denying all these things that don't add up. So again, I know that this video seems one-sided, but it's a cross-examination. It's them poking as many holes that they can in their narrative and her just falling apart, trying to answer these questions but still somehow holding herself together semi-decently with the body language where we're not seeing those exaggerated emotions that she did in her direct examination. So there it was, hope you enjoyed that. There was a lot going on, but I think some really cool little psychological bits and things that leaked her true intentions. Let me know in the comments what you thought and I will see you on the next one.